I don't care to be a model. It's not for me. I want to work at McDonald's. We don't have money. We don't have money. She used to like hide it from my stepdad that she would put me in these classes, right? Because it's a, an expense. My mom to this day will remember like my first big job. We got like a couch. People would come to our house and she'd be like, you see this couch? Valeria bought it. I asked you if I could get involved. Your response to me was that this is not a business. And I said, somebody just sent you $10,000. This is a business. This is something that could be scaled. Hi guys, welcome to uh, my brand new podcast. This is the first episode. Uh, the podcast is called Rise, and today I have um, a guest that was extremely hard to get. I, you know, I wanted to have a very impressive guest uh, uh, for my first episode. And as you know, in the podcast world, uh, the key is getting amazing guests. And I was lucky enough to get Valeria Lipovetsky, uh, my wife, to participate in this whim of mine to create a, a podcast so first of all babe thank you thank you for attending this podcast thank you so much i feel like every time you say my wife i need you to say my wife i know because you and your whole borat thing i say you know at least four times a day you make reference to borat this is part of the joys of being married to me yeah the um, best is when you say great success great success is my favorite one when you do great success <laughs> but i don't say it i just do thumbs up yeah i recently found a tiktok account that has all Borat stuff? It's all Borat stuff, so I went and I put it on my desktop. Maybe you can have him on your podcast. Sasha Cohen? Yeah. That would be dope. Because this is the podcast that okay, speaks tell me, tell on me. real life, okay, the so real let's, life stories of accomplished individuals. The real life stories of accomplished individuals. You got it, That babe. should be my tagline. Yeah. That is my tagline. The you real life it. stories of accomplished individuals. So the premise of this podcast is... Um, the real life stories of accomplished no, individuals. No, it is the real life stories of accomplished individuals. But specifically, um, you know, I felt that, and I have a genuine interest in this, I felt that there was a, a lack in the overall podcast world that would talk, that talks about the, the, the chronological story of how people um, came to notoriety, of how they became successful, about how they became famous, whatever it is that there was. And, you know, Blair, even for you, when you look at your career and everything that you've built mm -hmm. um you talk a little bit about your origin and about some of the hardships and you you might mention something here and there uh, but there's really not a a proper um sit down accounting for the timeline and everything that you've done and the turning points and um the the situations that you had to overcome the negative situations that you had to overcome mm -hmm. in order to get to where you are so i felt that there was I felt that this was missing in the podcast world. I agree. And I feel like it's so authentic to you because I feel like in even like social interactions, I find you always ask people these questions and really try to get to, you know, the the root of their success. And success can be, you know, in their business, in their personal life, and in, in a lot of different aspects. And I really love that about you. So I'm happy that you're doing this. Really? And I am your first guest. You are my first guest. You are my first guest. And, you know, I'll be using this. I'll be using you somewhat as my guinea pig to create, you know, the best episode I can to entice other people to, yeah. to come onto this podcast. And I feel that this is, uh, you know, this is something that's going to be ultimately of benefit to people because when you're young and you're in your, you know, let's say your 20s or even your early 30s or whatever age, when you're trying to accomplish something, when you're trying to start down that path, mm -hmm. people don't know. People don't that's the biggest challenge they have. And I talk to a lot of young people and they ask me the question, how do I get started? How do I get over that initial hump yeah. of, of getting started? And, you know, it's like I said, there's really nothing that I feel is taking someone through that entire life path to the point where you're, you're seeing someone. Like, it's easy to see someone's success and think it's impossible to get there. Yeah. But really breaking it down, I think, is important. I think also we celebrate so much, like, the end result of everything, like that success, quote-unquote, you know, of, but that's usually the, the kind of final step that we don't see all, like, the journey of it all. And I think through asking people to share their life story, so many different people will get inspired by so many different points of that person's life, you know? So I'm here for it. I'm rooting for you. Okay. This is my... 
Thank you. Thank you for being okay. So start the supportive wife that you are. Um, okay, so let's dive into your story. Um, so to give a little bit of background as to first of all who you are. I mean, everybody who's wa- listening to this and watching this right now is more than likely uh, someone who consumes your content on a regular basis. Uh, you are, of course, Valeria Lipovetsky. You are. I don't like the word influencer. Mm. Uh, you know, you're you're a personality. You're definitely a personality, but you, you know you are you are a celebrity. You're a, a celebrity. You're an online celebrity. Um, you have a collective audience of six and a half million people across uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, you work with hundreds of uh, top uh, brand advertisers all over the world. Um, Let's see what else. I mean, there's a lot Fortune of Fortune 500 companies. Yes, Fortune 500. <laughs> oh, I know about the Fortune 500 companies. You're obviously a mother, the mother of our three children, um, and you're just an all-around amazing person. So um, let's jump into how you started. Let's jump into kind of you know where this all started. So where were you born? Okay, so I was born in Cherkesk, Russia, which is in the south of Russia. Is it in the south? I believe it's like on the border of like, Kazakhstan or something. Kafkaz. Kafkaz, sure. So is it the south? Anyways, it's people south. always ask me and I well, never know. Well, was it really cold there at all? I don't remember. So I was born in Cherkesk, Russia to a very young mother. So my mom got married at 18, had me at 19. Um, and Sorry, I apologize. I have to interrupt. Let's just back up a little because you're making it sound like, you know, you're very casual about this Cherkesk, Russia, like it's Brooklyn or something. It's not. Like there's some complexity to where you were born. You were born in 1990 mm. in it was still the Soviet Union mm-hmm. and it's not like this big metropolitan city like Moscow. You were born in a in small town. Mm-hmm. You were born in small town Russia. Yeah. Um to a very young mother. Yeah. Um but it's important I think to understand the political situation of exactly where you're from. Yeah. Um so can you can you touch upon that? Yeah, so it was still the USSR, um, and it was a very troubling times back then. Uh, there was just a lot of crime and a lot of instability. And although my mother had a wonderful upbringing and she had great parents, she um, she did feel like it became kind of more and more dangerous for us to be there. So just to sorry, just to take you back a little bit, my mom got married at eighteen, had me at nineteen. Her my biological father cheated on my mom when I was two months. My mom left, and shortly after that, we immigrated to Israel. So she was like a single mom in Russia with a young daughter, and that was just like not an optimal. No, but there was there was more to that story. I mean, your mm-hmm. mom. Your mom left. It wasn't so easy. You can't just like get up and say, "Hey, I'm out of here." Like I'm bouncing. I'm leaving. I'm leaving Russia. Yeah. I mean, there was first of all, you know, you talked before about there was she lost her father. Yeah. So she lost her father to, um, to like violence and to just like the landscape of how everything was going on there back then. You know, myself being actually, I was born in 1973, so I was born in the Soviet Union, like a solid. 19 years before it fell apart um and that was the story my parents told me about which was the anti-semitism and you being jewish your mom being jewish i know your father your biological father he was christian Mm -hmm. however being jewish in that region Mm -hmm. at that time Mm -hmm. did your mom ever tell you stories about her own challenges as a jew in that region i think she never really experienced it like anti-Semitism, maybe she experienced some anti-Semitism, but that wasn't really like a thing there. Uh, I think some of the, you know, stories she tells me always amplifies how they were very much living in, uh, in a very, um, how do you say, like a very nice mixed community. Like they were Christian, Muslims, and Jews, and everyone together. And because religion wasn't so amplified back then, and like well, USSR, religion, religion wasn't allowed. It wasn't allowed. During- yeah, so it wasn't very thought of so she never really again never focused on that that was never her thing I think what was scary for her and what made her really move was the fact that it was just very scary times and there was just so much uncertainty in that area and there was a lot of like rebel groups and a lot of people that were just doing a lot of bad things you mentioned you mentioned that there were a lot of uh yeah, she would say like you could get kidnapped on the street just like in broad daylight. It was it was very um, 
kind of savage. So know? it was just overrun. I mean, it was overrun by crime. Yeah, it was just very because it was already the beginning of kind of the fall, right? It was it, when we moved. It was nineteen ninety two. I think mm -hmm. so it was already started to feel that like uncertainty you know a lot of st stuff started happening and um and yeah and I think she was just very scared and obviously what solidified her decision was you know seeing when her, her when her father was passed killed. away yeah so well, he passed away I mean he was murdered yeah or is that too personal maybe I don't know it's not my story to tell no I know but I mean when you say he was when when we say he was a uh, he you know he he died due to violence I mean he yeah. was he was murdered yeah okay so I think at that point she was just like I need and she to had get a small, out of here I mean that you you have to you you know we, they he, were I living think, very well like that's another interesting thing like wait wait wait, wait my wait, mother wait, wait, grew wait, wait. up my mother grew up well no but she didn't but she did no because i saw the vlog that you made when you went to go meet your biological father for but the first time but that was after my grandfather passed away already that apartment was where i was like born into that was her apartment that you visited when you were in when you did the vlog yes when you met that's your where, biological father yes but, but her, that i saw that apartment it wasn't nice it wasn't nice now but it was very nice back then her father, my grandfather, used to be like the, um, how do you say it? Like, he used to own like a vagzal. How do you say a vagzal? Like a supermarket? Not a, it wasn't a supermarket. It was like a place where all these products would come from clothes to food to all these things. A terminal, and a food terminal. Yeah. That was a very like big thing, you know, to, he was running it. So, so I think it's important to give your kind of, have some perspective about what your mom had to go through because... To be now, you, you know, she's a 19, maybe she was already 20 years old, you know, single with a, a one and a half or a two year old mm -hmm. to pick up by herself mm -hmm. to leave to a completely foreign country she'd never been to before. Like, you got to respect. Your, oh, I respect. Your mom's. Like, I. Well, that's that's that, that's an extremely brave move on her part to 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 do that. So she decided to go to Israel. Israel, obviously, um, in the 90s was like the big immigration from all the Jews, especially from uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. So um, everyone that was Jewish uh, made an aliyah, which is what we did. And there were social programs there. There was the ability for, for her to take you, yeah. like you know, a single mom with a small kid, yeah. to take you. And, and you, the, you were offered, you and your mom were offered help yeah. in the beginning through the social programs yeah. as Jews come, going to Israel. Correct. So we arrived to Israel and um, I don't necessarily know what she went through because I was kind of still little. I feel like my first memories started at like the age of five. And I remember just us moving from place to place. My mother was working at uh, Russian restaurants. So her background was musical. So she used to be like a singer. Uh, um, yes uh, but she in order obviously to make money and try to support like a young child and herself in a new country she used to work as like washing dishes or cutting up uh, produce during the day at this restaurant and then in the evening she would like change do her hair and makeup and go on stage and sing so I was with her throughout the days um and what do you mean throughout the day? So while she was like chopping this, vegetables, you were yeah, sitting on a chair. Yes, beside her? all these restaurants like kind of became my my home, and um, and obviously I experienced it from my kind of pers perspective, which was pretty fun. There were a lot of like good people around, but I'm sure my mom also experienced the bad side and the scary side of like also bad people that you meet that take advantage of you. But she really like protected me from it. So, uh, so yeah. So that's how I grew up, and I remember just moving from like place to place. I have these vague memories of just like being outside at night, walking around the neighborhood at night by myself when I'm like six. Why would you be walking around? Because my mother used to work and like a lot, and at some point she especially couldn't take late, me. Sorry, especially late at night, right? Yeah, like late at night. Exactly. And she at couldn't take me all the time to these places, right? A lot of it was already like grown up time, like in the evenings um, when she used to like sing at these bars or whatever restaurants. So 
I used to just kind of, I, there was someone who was babysitting me, but like, you know, people, it was so different back then. It was just like, they just figure it out. So I have just like random memories of me walking around like Tel Aviv at night by myself. Maybe I'm making them up. I don't know. But like, okay. So, but talk to me about, <laughs> like, explain to me on the, like financially. So what your mom was working around the clock, daytime, nighttime. This wasn't. This wasn't, uh, I mean, by no means did you grow up wealthy, but just from conversations I've had with you, you never felt any kind of class struggle. You never felt that you were, or, or you did, I don't know. What was your, as a child growing up, what was your perception of your financial status? I think I didn't, I think I didn't have any perception of financial status until I was probably in high school when I started seeing and like observing other people and what they had. But I don't think I was raised that way. And I think that's why I don't really have attachment to anything material because it never meant anything to me. It was never a way of how love or success or anything was measured. You know what I mean? It was never measured by things. I think we moved so much. Uh, we lived in the communities of like other Russian immigrants. You know, we, there were just, things were not important. Did you ever feel like, scared that you were you were going to be in the street or that you wouldn't have enough or that your mother wouldn't be able to like you guys wouldn't be able to survive no that was never a stress that you had no i think my mom and the energy she brought to the house just felt like i saw that she was working a lot and doing the most but it came from a place of just like we'll figure it out it was not like oh my god it's the end of the world like everything always works out. And that's kind of, you see, my mom is still like that today. She's like, even if she's stressed, it's like she'll figure it out because she always does. So I think that kind of resilience that I felt from her just made me feel very comfortable and know that we'll figure it out. So I grew up with her uh, like that. And again, she was, she built a community around herself of other like single Russian moms with their kids. And we kind of grew up together. Um, my best friend, like my childhood, the mm -hmm. same story they met. And there's a lot of similarity in the stories, you know, of these women that escaped uh, home violence or, you know, all these other just so would you traumatic say, would events. Would you say your mom experienced violence with, men whether it was your bio biological yeah. father or yeah yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you say it like it's very normal because i think that if you grow up in that environment it's it, it is not like, i don't want to say normal I, i'm not normalizing it but it was yeah there were a lot of abusive relationship like i mentioned you know there's people that take advantage of a young woman people mean you're talking about men specifically yeah um take advantage of like young women you know my mother was in a new country didn't speak the language, had a baby, like had a child to support. So yeah, I'm sure that there's a lot she doesn't even tell me, but I can see that it's there. So um, she had to do what she, she had, had to, to do, what she, she had, had to, to do, a hundred percent. So she eventually remarried. So she remarried and my stepdad came into the picture when I was about five years old. And I literally remember the day we were living at that point in like this subdivision that was for uh, new immigrants uh, in Ofakim, which is like a small little town beside Bersheva. And I remember he came in and I remember that day. And, uh, and that's it. And he was in my life ever since. What, how old were you? I was five. Okay. And then, so if you were five, there's a six year difference between you and Bob. Yeah. So, so one year me, later, talk to me about Bob. <laughs> so one year later, we at that point moved to Beersheba, which is a bigger city in the south in, of Israel, and um, we lived in an apartment building that was like low-income apartment building. This was you, your mom, and your stepdad. Yeah. Your stepdad's name is Leon. Leon. So Leon, Leonia, <laughs> Leonid. <laughs> Uh, so we moved there and my mom is pregnant and my mom had my brother Boris when I was six years old. Okay. So now you've got little Boris. Yes. Okay. And you know, I know, I know for a fact that 
to, to you, he's your brother. You, he's been, you've been together since birth. And I know that whenever somebody uses the term half brother, you get really offended. And I, and I understand why Bob, 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 I've, I've never known him as anything except your brother. Um, so yeah, so now you're, you've got Bob, you got, so by the way, when I say Bob, his name is Boris, but he chose to call himself Bob when he moved to Canada when he was about 10 yeah, years old. Yeah, we'll talk about that another time. Okay. So, <laughs> but can I refer to him as Bob for the purpose of this podcast? Because that's how I know him. Uh, Would you prefer sh- I call him Boris? Does Boris he- is his name. I, I am, <laughs> I've, sh- I'm done with Canadian. Uh, You're not calling him Bob anymore? No. Okay. He'll always be Bob to me, but if you, if you like, I can, I can call him Boris. Okay. <laughs> So Boris, if you're watching. Okay, so an- oh, <laughs> hi Boris. So enter my little brother. Okay. Um, have a whole f- like full family unit. I have my stepdad, my mom, my little brother, and myself. We're living in this low income in Bersheva. So how do, like, my how- parents are living uh, are working at a restaurant together. So Leonia was also he a was musician. He was also an entertainer. Yeah. Okay. So they were both working uh, in the evenings or like on the weekends during the day, if you, like they had parties. Um, and it was very, I mean, it's, an, it's a difficult profession to be in because you work when there's work. It's not guaranteed, right? And um, what profession is? Your profession is not guaranteed. You work when you work too. Musicians. Work. Yeah, I guess. But it's like, People have to book you. Like, you can't drive your career forward, really. You know what you're I mean? You're right. Well, yes or no. Yeah, okay, you're right. In that specific scenario, well, like working manag- in a if, restaurant. If I was managing her at the time, it would have been different. I'm sure but. she would be next to Celine Dion today. Correct. But, um, but yes, so so that, that was that. And, I mean, we always had... I remember always being around talking about money. And that really annoyed me. I really hated it. It was always about money. It was always my stepdad being like, we're going to be in the streets. We don't have money. We don't have money. There was a big culture of borrowing money from each other. Um, and From it each was other, meaning like among from, friends? Among friends. and fa- Like people were always in debt. Like that was just always a thing. And I remember that something that even as a child, it was like, I do not want my life to revolve around money you know like it's just it was very draining to me and i found that my stepdad was always complaining about having no money not really doing anything about it and my mom was you know my mom wanted to move up in life and she wanted to progress and she wanted you know a nicer apartment and she wanted new couch and she wanted you know wear nice clothes and she always figured it out so if she needed to get another job or a third job she would and um, that was just kind of what i grew up around so she was always driving the family she was always maneuvering the ship even while also trying to I don't know. I don't know if she did it, honestly. Okay. So you're, you're growing up in Israel. You've got Bob. So now you've got the first, I guess, feeling of a real family, right? Mm-hmm. You're like five, six, seven. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, considering the previous years, I mean, you were an infant, but now you have a real family. You've got your brother. You've got your stepdad, um, your mom, obviously, and, and you guys are a family. So time's going by. Uh, you're going to high school. Um, Again, you're kind of living, your family is So my mom always invested in me. I feel like my mom always told me, like, you are going to be, like, special. And it was funny because I was a crazy, shy, introverted child growing up. And she would always try to put me on stage or make me do different things or, like, go dancing and do this. And I would always just be so... Like, I would just cry and run away. And I feel like for her, it was such a, it was a big disappointment because she is a performer. My grandmother was a performer. And she's like, what is going on? Like, I was such a com- complex child, you know, like inflicted with self-complex. So complexities, what am I saying? Yes. So, um, yeah. So I think for her, she was just trying to find a way to get me out of my shell. But she always told me like, you're, you know, you're going to do this and you're going to be this. And so she actually got me private English lessons when I was very young. Really? I didn't know that. I thought you learned English by watching TV. No, she got me a private tutor that I used to go 
twice a why, week or why, once a week. Why English? You're living in Israel. You already speak. I think that she just knew that she's like. No, but hold on a second. You you sp you speak Russian at the time. You you're you know you're a child. You speak Russian, which half the country speaks mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. um, you speak Hebrew, which mm -hmm. everybody the other half of the country speaks. So between, everybody speaks Hebrew. Everybody speaks yes. Hebrew. Yes. Okay, so between Hebrew and Russian, you're set in your small part of the world. So what, what made your mom? I mean, look, obviously your mom's been. A, your mom was a driving force behind, yeah. kind of pushing you forward. Why did she decide that English was the correct language? I think she saw that I was very interested, so I was watching and and, re and reading and like listening to a lot of English music, and she saw that I, that I am drawn to that, and I think that she also, in a way, always knew that there's more out there. So she really wanted me to learn English. So when she could uh, for the little while, you know, financially, I think she didn't even, she used to like hide it from my stepdad that she would put me in, in, in these classes, right? Because it's a, an expense. So she, uh, she put me in English with an English tutor. She's a sweet lady. And um, I've learned with like English with her and, um, and that's it. And then I never did any extra curriculum. So even today, you know, it's so funny. Curricular. Some curricular. Even today when we talk about like all this stuff that the boys do, the tennis, the this, the yeah. that. Oh my God. It's like, what is this life? They're so beyond privileged. I was not doing any of that. My brother didn't do any of that. Because you didn't have money to do that. You're making it sound like there was a choice. If your mom would have had the financial means to put you in five it different sports. It was just sports. such a... It was such a privilege. It was so like, wow. What was a privilege? That kind of stuff to put, you know, in different circles and put them in like gymnastics or whatever. It was such a, not a common thing for in our circle. And for me, like sometimes I kind of zone out of our lives here and I just look at it from the side. And like for our kids, it's such a basic, or you know, in our environment today, it's so basic. Like everyone has their kids going to 16 different things and i'm it's it's just funny to me sometimes i, know, I have but these no, but you, you 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 i understand that you, it's all different no but you're no no hold on your perception is that it's basic because now the circumstances that you find yourself in living in you could call it what it is you 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 live in a in an upscale community in the united states and to you, it seems normal, but to the vast majority yes. of people, it's not normal. Like, it's like all of the stuff that you... But I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about the va vast majority. I'm talking about... I, you're I was at that time. Okay. So yeah. at that time, so I understand. So now you're learning English, you're in school, obviously public school, right? Yeah. Along with the, the other, you know, the, the, I don't the, think the there majority. Was school. The, I didn't know. Well, maybe, maybe there was. Who knows? Anyway, so I was a very mediocre student. I was always the kind of student that was like, teachers will be, will have my mom come to the school and be like, she has so much potential. That kind of thing, you know? So they're, much potential. They're trying to be polite. No, they were like, she could do well if she just... If she did well. If she like cared enough. Got it. Okay. So hold on a sec. Take me, take me to, let's talk about, let's talk about kind of how you got into modeling. Like you're obviously... You're obviously very easy to look at, and you have been since the day I've met you, and I'm assuming that you you, you were uh, long before I met you. But my question, I guess, is what got you into, so into, what was your next step? The thing is, I know your story, so I don't want to prompt right. your story. So okay, let me tell happened, you, what happened wait, let me later? tell you this one very memorable incident that I had uh, at school. It was in high school, and it was with my math teacher, which was, it was, I don't know why, it's like a core memory for me. How so. I was like maybe 12 or 13. All right. So I'm in the bathroom. I excuse myself from the lesson um, and I'm in the bathroom and I was like, she comes in and I was just fixing my hair and she went to the bathroom. She comes beside me. She washes her hand and she looks at me and she says, beauty won't take you far in life. And then she walks out and I was like, okay. And I was already very insecure. I was in general a very insecure child as it is. So I, that kind of like was so shocking to me that an adult that I respected, it was like she was like this Russian sure, strict yeah. math teacher. Sure, teacher sure. And I just remember I was like, mm, okay. And, uh, but it was funny because the following year is when I started getting into modeling. <laughs> okay, so now you're 14 years old. Okay, so that's like the bridge into the modeling story. So, so... How did you get into modeling? So the way I got into modeling was um, for my bat mitzvah. 
my mother was just, you know, my mother loves to do the most always. So she hired this professional photographer from Tel Aviv to come to Beersheba and take photos of me. And those photos, she blew up into these like mega posters and she put it all over the uh, venue for my bat mitzvah. So while we were taking pictures, the photographer was like, she's very photogenic. Have you ever considered taking her, like trying her with modeling? And my mom said, uh, no, but, you know, she started, she got a little thing in her head. So I think she saw like, okay, here's a direction. Because she couldn't figure me out, you know, like she couldn't place me. And that kind of gave her, I feel like, a bit of a direction. So she started pushing into that industry. So we used to have a local uh, agency in Beersheba. Her name was Esterika Nagid. She was a con artist, obviously. And why, why obviously? <laughs> because it was this, she would like, she would make you pay, I think, 2,000 or 3,000 shekels. And she creates like a portfolio for you. And then she books jobs for you. And the jobs are literally like fashion shows at malls or like stuff like that. So okay. I used, it was like a traveling circus. So on the weekends, and I you, used and to. And you were the clown. I was the clown. <laughs> uh, and... And you would get paid like 60 shekels, maybe 40 shekels, like yeah. nothing, peanuts, right? So on the weekends, that's what I used to do. I used to do like modeling and travel around and like do little shows here and there, local At like shows. like little local strip malls? Yeah, strip malls or like Yama Melach, uh, like the Dead Sea, sorry, the Dead Sea. Like there would be a little hotel, you know, there'd be like, oh, here's, we have a program, we have a fashion show. So it's stuff like that I used to do. And you were how old? I was like 14. All right. And then, and my mom just put me into anything. She's like you know, whatever, what she knew, what she found out about, she was like, here, go. So then she heard there was a competition online for, it called like Miss Beauty or something, right? Um, and it was actually for the Russian, for the Russian-Israeli crowd, because it was like a Russian website. So my mother decided to submit my photos, my bat mitzvah photos, into this competition. And there were like so many submissions you saw so many girls and she told me about it after and I saw all of them and they were like all you know older and developed and there's like very sexy photos and then there's little me and I was like okay this is really awkward but whatever it was online it was not a big deal and then we get a call and they're like oh she won first place you're missing a lot of the story what are you talking about hold on a second how about the whole like you didn't want to go and you wanted to work at McDonald's story one second. We haven't reached that yet. We haven't reached that Absolutely yet? Absolutely not. You're, oh, you're uh, making everything go very fast. Right. So then I win the competition. Um, this was a Beersheba competition. That was a competition that was all over Israel. But where did it take place? In Tel Aviv. So you had to go to Tel Aviv. Yes. Remember when I did this? Da -na -na -na, I got a story that one time I went yes. to that one. So those who watch my content will know. So anyways, that was a very traumatic time in my life because as I told my followers before, I, uh, my community before, I went to, to this event. Mm -hmm. My mom couldn't come because she was working that night. So she made her friend and her son who had a crush on come with us. Who had a what? A, I had a crush on him. You had a crush on him. Yes. And he was a, like older. And I just remember I was like, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to win first prize. And it's all this thing. We got like a brand new outfit. I did my hair and makeup, like big expenses, right? So we travel all the way from Beersheba to Tel Aviv, an hour and a half by car. And we get there and it turns out to be this like nightclub. Super sketchy. So I've, I'm like, whatever. I'm with my mom's friend. I have an adult with me. Oh, your mom oh, was good. there. My mom was in there. She was working. She couldn't come. Right. So then we're at this club and I'm just like Valeria. I'm like self-talking, self-motivating. You got to be confident. You can do this. 14. This is your moment. 14. 14. Yeah. I think I was already like 15 actually. I'm like, you can do this. Nah, nah, nah. Anyways, I go up on the second floor and they're telling me they're going to announce the winners. So like be close. I'm standing there and I see I'm with my mom's friend. And everyone's like looking at me and I'm just like, hey, yes, the hair, the makeup, the outfit, this is my night. And then this one girl comes up to my mom's friend and she's like, I'm so sorry. I think your daughter just got her period. So I got my period literally before I was supposed to go on stage. I'm wearing white pants. This wasn't your first period, though. No, you not my first, first period, no, okay. but I it was still in the beginning stages, like as me as developing as a woman. So. All right. I wasn't aware of the timing, you know? So 
I have this huge stain on my pants. I start freaking out. I'm like, obviously. It was, it was white pants? Yes, of course it was white pants because, you know, when it strikes, it strikes. I really don't know. No, no but, but I mean like when, you know, when it pours, it when it rains, it pours. Sure, let's continue. <laughs> I want to find another uh, um, analogy. Yes, but I can. Sure. Anyway, so we run to the bathroom. She's like starts washing my pants. And then we hear an announcement. Valeria Yafanova, first prize. Come to the stage. And I'm so standing in the... my underwear. I did win. I was numb. I knew that I won the first place, first prize. So I'm standing in my underwear oh, in the bathroom. Oh, you knew before you went down there? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. So I'm standing in my underwear and I'm just like, I'm, I'm crying. My makeup is running. I'm a mess. I'm like, I can't believe this. I'm 15, 14 years old, 14 or 15. I'm like, I'm not equipped to deal with that kind of like event, right? Okay. So anyways, I put my pants, soaking pants, run to the stage, grab my freaking prize and run out of there. And I'm just like, I never want to do this again, ever. I'm already like such an insecure child. To me, that experience was just like, I'm going back under my rock and I'm going to live my life. Okay, goodbye. So I get my prize. It was a box of soap. <laughs> you see, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm, I'm telling you, the irony of it all. Um, and that's how is, it. How is the soap ironic? I don't understand. What's the irony in soap? Because then I took the soap and, and I washed my pants washed with it. pants with the soap. All right. Uh, needless, <laughs> needless to say that my, uh, my crush was like, was just sitting at the front in the car being like, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. Anyway, so I get back and I just told my mom, don't ever do this. I never want to do this again. I hate this. This is not a, something I want to do. Two weeks later, we get a phone call from Shai, who was the president of elite models in Israel. He calls, he's like, hi. I saw Valeria, um, I was at this club and I saw Valeria and she won the first prize and I think she has a really promising career. Would you like to come in and see like if we can work together? My mom is like, yay, McDonald's. So this is where I told her, I do not want to be a model. I don't care to be a model. It's not for me. I want to work at McDonald's. Because all my friends back then got their jobs working at McDonald's. It was at 15 because it was still illegal for me to work. But I was like, the minute I turn 16, I'm getting a job at McDonald's. My mom is like, you're not freaking working at McDonald's. Like, that's not going to work. You're going and you're going to do this. I said, absolutely not. So then after months of going back and forth, we made a, a deal that if I don't get the McDonald's you job. You and your mother made a deal. Yes. <clears throat> if I don't get accepted to McDonald's, I'm going to go and explore this opportunity with elite models. So then I went to McDonald's. I completely blew it. They did you not blew accept the interview. me. Yes. Because I had to do something. I had to like do something there. And I did that. Do, I I'll did not do well. I'll just know that I didn't blow the interview at McDonald's. And I actually worked at McDonald's for you some see? time. You see, you, you lived my dream. I was a more advanced 15 year old than you were. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I did not. Uh, I was fired though from a bunch of jobs. Like I tried to get, I, I tried to work probably since I started from at the age of 14. I tried to find like odd jobs to do to like get some money. And I was fired from was, every single one of them. What was motivating you at the age of like 14 or 15 to do odd jobs? Honestly, all my friends were working. And it's not like I had like allowance or anything. Like I had to beg my parents to give me some money. At that point, you already go to the movies with your friends. You know, you want to buy, I don't know, gum. You want to grab like lunch or something. So you say gum? Yeah. That's your motivator? It was yeah. Gum. So going because to the my stepdad wouldn't allow me to like go for like out for lunch with my friends. He thought it was like absolutely insane. It's like, you want to go to a restaurant at 14? With your friend? Is the issue that you were 14 or yeah, the issue my age. spending the money? No, my age. And spending the money. It's like, well, you sit home and eat. Anyway, so I was like, okay, I'm going to make my own money and I'm going to be able to buy my own gum, okay? So I did not get accepted to McDonald's. As promised, we went to Tel Aviv. We met with the agency. And that's it. I signed my contract and I started working. Okay, so, what, so you're 15 years old. Now you're... Oh my God, yes. You're a model. So yeah. what happened what happened with school? Like was high school finished for you? No, I would still go to high school. It's not like when you start being a model all of a sudden you get all the jobs and you're living the life. No. You I used to uh take like during the week there were like one or two days where I would leave school early 
or like miss some classes. I would get on the bus. I would take go to Tel Aviv, and then do like castings, and then I would come back. And uh, yeah, and I started kind of slowly getting some jobs, and I would give the money to my mom. And my mom to this day will remember like my first big job. We got like a couch for our household. It was like a big thing, and she would. People would come to our house and she'd be like, you see this couch? Valeria bought it. It was like a big deal. And, uh, and yeah, and I what, started what, getting... What color was the couch? It was like green because everything was green in our house. My mom, green, my green mom always color. had theme. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so then we... It was brown. I'm lying. It was brown. Anyway, so we... Uh, yeah, I started working and I started making a little bit of money and uh, I started getting more opportunities and then, you know, I started like getting like meeting more people through the industry and meeting new friends through modeling and um and that's it and I was just like at basically 15 16 I was already like in Tel Aviv by myself staying over sometimes at friends house if I had like a job the next day we used to like go clubbing it was like amazing it was great okay and then so you're you're clubbing in Tel Aviv you're you're a teenager you're like 16 17 I'm assuming and no, you, very underage, 16. 16. So I had no business in these clubs. Okay, so you're, so you're no longer living in Beersheba with your parents? I used No, I was still living, but I used to take advantage of like the fact that if I had a photo shoot the next day, I would be like, oh, I have to go, so I'll be fresh for the photo shoot tomorrow, and I would stay over at a friend's house, and then we'll go out, and then I'll go to work on... How did you make these friends where you were staying with them? Like? Through modeling. All my friends were like other models that I met from... But they were around. your age. Yeah. So you're staying at their parents' house? Yeah, their home. parents' house. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, a bunch of like them adopted me being like, oh, this is our little Bersheva girl. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you, at some point, you left Israel. So where did you leave Israel and where did you go? So I started traveling for work. Uh, my first trip was when I was 16. I went to Paris. And I was in Paris by myself for like a month. And I hated every minute of it. It Why? was horrible. Uh, because... People were just really mean and I was very scared. And, you know, you think you're like independent when you're in your home country and you like know the language and you're cool and stuff. But then this was my first travel. My mom couldn't come with me. So I was staying at like a she model apartment. Go. She couldn't afford, number one, she couldn't afford to leave work. And yeah, exactly. There was also like the flights and the hotels yeah, yeah, of course. and all that stuff. Yeah. So I stayed in this like model apartment, but like no one really cares about you. And you're kind of, you know, left for your to your own device. And, um, yeah, I was just very lonely and very sad and I didn't get any jobs. I was just walking around going to all these castings. I didn't really get anything. After Paris, I went to Japan and I was there for about two to three months. And that was an amazing experience. And I met a lot of like great friends and just like modeling honestly just gave me such an amazing insight into the world and different people and how to just navigate life. Um, I'm very thankful that I had a really good head on my shoulders. And I think that's obviously props to my mom and to my stepdad that raised me in a way where even in situations where I could have easily gone the easy way of just like drugs and alcohol and all that stuff, I did not, you know, it just, it never appealed to me. Um, so I just really, I feel like took the most out of it. I made money. I was making great money. And um, I was traveling the world and I was doing my thing. So I never finished high school in like uh, in the traditional way. I then moved to finish high school in like a, a hybrid way where I would go and do my exams in like Israeli embassy around the world. And that's how I finished my high school. Okay. And, uh, and that's it. And that was my modeling experience. Okay. And so then how did you eventually make your way to North America. So your mom and your, okay, so let's back up for a second. So your mom left Israel to move to Canada. Yeah. So in Israel, it was a very, also very core memory for me. There was a really big terror attack uh, at a nightclub and it was a lot of Russian kids. It was a Russian nightclub. I remember it was in Batyam. It was called Dolfinarium. And there was a suicide bomber that came and stood in line. And there were about, I don't remember the exact number, but like over 80 Russian Jewish kids died. 
and it was people that we knew it was friends of friends it really really shook us and i think it shook my mom and i remember we were watching this we we're watching the news sitting at home and my mom looked at the at the screen and she said i'm not raising you guys here and that's it she i didn't really like we never talked about it again but i started seeing that she was making efforts into moving um and she started like traveling to canada well, hold on but she was still married to your stepdad so she was gonna she was planning on taking him with her it was already like a rocky relationship um he also cheated on her so she was already kind of like checked out and she also wanted to make sure that boris won't do the army she was very scared for him to do the army as you know army is uh, service is mandatory in israel so she uh, she started kind of building towards moving out of Israel and she started traveling to Canada by herself to try to figure out, okay, okay how do I get paper? How do I get sponsored? Why, Can I get a why visa? Why Canada? Why did she choose Canada? Because it was the easiest country to get into. Um, Canada is amazing for immigrants. They're very open. Um, and, you know, if you're creative and find a way in, you're good. So she started looking for ways, try to see how she can take, you know, her education and what she had at least to show and, and get a visa somehow. Anyways, as my mom track record chose, she figured it out. And she moved to Israel when Bob was, uh, when Boris was 10. She moved to Canada. Uh, to Canada, sorry. She moved to Canada when Boris was 10 years old. At that point, I was 16. I decided to stay because I was already like traveling for modeling. I was making money. I was still kind of in Beersheba, but mostly in Tel Aviv. I rented an apartment. I wasn't really in like Israel that often. And uh, I couldn't really imagine going to Canada. I went to visit her here and there, but that Canada never appealed to me. So I stayed doing my thing. I was basically left the house and became independent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's it. And then after traveling and doing all the things, uh, when I was 19, I decided that it's time for me to join my mom. I was... To I, join her to live with her? To live with her in Canada. But you didn't like Canada. Why did you I didn't like Canada, but I really wanted to see my brother get older. I feel like whenever I would come visit, he like grew and became, you know, like a dude. And I just felt like I was missing him you know and his kind of growth and I miss my mom a lot and I just felt like I wanted something a bit more grounding I was living out of a suitcase for three years and mm -hmm. I just kind of I got over it so I moved to Canada um, I also actually moved to Canada because I also met in Israel which is life is amazing like that but um, I met in Israel this guy who became my boyfriend and he was actually originally from Canada and he moved to Tel Aviv and then we both of us decided, when I decided it's time to move because I miss my mother, he also decided he's going to go back to live with his parents uh, in Canada. So when I moved to Canada, it was like with him. So I got exposed to just like a different side of Canada. I met some friends. You know, I, I got to experience it a bit differently. So it wasn't so bad. And uh, yeah, and I moved in with my mom at the suburbs in Canada, Toronto. So hold on a second, but you weren't, when you and I met, you were already... When you and I met the first time, you were 19. We met at a Shabbat dinner. So that was like the first year you were living, in Canada. You were living in Canada. But yeah. Then, but then you and I didn't see each other for an entire year Yeah. after that. And yeah. And when I when, when I saw you... you yeah. I, when you were already... I was planning already to move to New York. I thought you were already living in New York. No. I was in my on my way to move to New York. So I was still modeling. That was like my main source of income. And um, I figured that, not figured, I realized that there's no industry really of fashion in Canada. So mm -hmm. I decided to move to New York at the age of like 20. No, I was still 19, I think. I moved to New York. Um, and that's when I came to visit my mom. I saw you. And that's when we... No, you and I... Oh, you're meaning... No, you were already 20. Not the yeah. first time you, you and I met. Yeah, so the first time we met was at Shabbat dinner at Mary's, which I was my first year in Canada. The second time I saw you, I was about to leave. It was at this another Russian restaurant. I was about to leave to New York. I uh, literally left like a few days later. And then the third time I saw you was when I came back to visit my mom from New York. Right. And that's when we met and that's when we started talking. And you were just very persistent and consistent and now we're here so when you i mean that's kind of a shortcut but <laughs> the the uh the episode's not over so when are you okay for time 
Are you okay for time? I'm okay for time. How are you going to be doing this? This is so extensive. That's the point of this whole thing. I think it's well, more extensive with you because I know a lot about you, so I can put in the cues to get you talking. But I'll have to do research on other people that I'm that I'm interviewing. Yeah. So okay, so let's talk about when when you met me. So when you met me, you were 20 years old. Yeah. When you met me, you were 19. But when you actually when we met and we there was like you know a romance, you were you were 20. I was 38. Um, so I, you know I'm, I'm 18 years older than you, and I guess. You know, you and I became serious very quickly, and it was on my initiative. Um, you know, considering the amount of what's a polite way to say it, I guess, kind of like failed relationships that you saw your mother go through, and a lot of the stuff that that happened there, and there was a lot of trauma there. Obviously, you're only 20 years old. You're obviously very young. How did you, how did you not carry over? kind of the trauma that came from, um, you know, that came from seeing your mother's, and we only talked about the two relationships. There were other relationships as well, I assume. Um, how did you not carry that trauma over and how did you not, how were you not scared to get involved with someone, especially someone so much older than you um, after seeing what happened with your mom? I think because I was exposed to it from such a young age and I'm very different than my mother in general, like as people were just very different and the way I see the world and, uh, and consume it is very different. I kind of trusted my instincts to figure out what it is that I need in my life and what it is that I don't. And I think that I saw the things that I needed in my life in you when I met you. So... It, you know what when we first started dating and stuff I mean I was very infatuated by you and you mm. know there was love and all the stuff but it was bigger than that it was like it felt like um, some kind of like I found a home in you you know and I think that because there was so much instability in my life since I was so little I recognize stability in you just like the person that you are you know your core and you are very sure of it and that's something that's very hard to find in people um, especially not something that I was used to seeing around me so to me it was I just knew that I'll be able to to build a life and to build myself and to learn about myself only if I have a partner beside me that has that you know aspect in him so to me, that's why I think everything moved really fast and I didn't try to stop it because it just felt right. Um, and that's it. And I, I've always been very big into like trusting my own intuition. You also trusted your mother because you told me 10 days after you and I met, I told you that you would be my wife at some point. I, mm -hmm. I told you I'm not proposing to you yet, but 10 days into it, I said, you are going to be my wife and that's where this is going. And your response to me is, come meet my mother. And if my mother approves, yeah. then we can continue dating. A hundred percent. So you trusted, I mean, your own intuition, but also your mother. Definitely. So what did your mother, so after I went and met your mother and your mother said to me right away, like, what do you, what do you want? Kind of what are your intentions? And I told her that I loved you. And I told her that um, my plan is to marry you. And she said, well, continue dating. And if, if it's her choice, it's not my choice, it's her choice. So what did your mother say to you after she met me and assessed me? She said, I approve. That's it? Yeah. It was the, the conversation wasn't more than that? Mm -mm. She Was she concerned about the age difference? Mm -mm. Really? Yeah. Okay. I know you were concerned a little bit about the age difference. There was a split second when you wanted to call it off. I wouldn't say call it off. Yeah, it was a concern to me. And I think it will always be something, you know, we think about. Yeah. But, again, I just, it just... It felt right, so I just let it, you know, continue going. Okay, and then right after we got married, we immediately, we didn't wait, we had a kid right away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at this point, you're not modeling anymore. Mm -hmm. So just getting back to your career and how it's kind of intertwined with your personal life, you, you weren't modeling anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, the interesting thing about it is that when you and I got together, it didn't even cross my mind, and I've said this to you on many occasions, it didn't even cross my mind what you would be doing professionally. It's funny because being such a, I feel like I'm a pragmatic person when it comes to business yeah. and money, 
And, yeah. the, and the fact, thanks. And the fact that. <laughs> what does pragmatic mean? Pra like practical. Oh, and, yeah, I, and, very. I, and I think, and I think things through. Yeah. Very. And I try to plan ahead. Yes. I believe that's what the. You are definitely. I believe that's the definition of pragmatic. If I, that's the definition, I, then you are. Okay. So hold on. Uh, you made me lose what I was saying. What was I saying, babe? That you being so pragmatic. So yeah, I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind because I loved you so much that it didn't even, it didn't even register to me what you would be doing. I didn't even think to myself, oh, I'll take, I just I didn't think, think you about planted it. a seed very early on because it was when we were still engaged or even before we got engaged, when we used to talk about like what's interesting to me and you know, what's kind of my, how does my future look this to me? This was before we got married? Yeah. I remember you said it, you were still living in Bel Air, I remember it. I remember you said like, your life will be your art. You literally said that. Like before we even got married, before social media, I don't, before I don't anything. Rem I don't remember saying that, but it sounds like something that I would spit. So yeah, you did that. And it was so funny how it kind of manifested itself. It did, it did. So yeah, so I was modeling. I wasn't modeling so much anymore. Obviously we oh, no, had the were, first you kid. Were, you were pregnant. I mean, we literally conceived Jake yeah. three days after the wedding. Yeah, and I started getting... Uh, um, I was kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? So let's let's stop for a second. So for me, I never, when when shortly after we got married and we started having kids, I never said to you, hey, like you should think about what you're doing for work. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I actually, I know for a fact that it was never me who was pushing that agenda to say like, what are you going to do? Like mm -hmm. I never put any kind of pressure on you mm -hmm. to do anything professionally at all. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you came to me. And you said to me, like, you were thinking of going to school. The suggestion that I made to you was go get a business degree. Mm -hmm. And the reason I suggested to go get a business degree, because I feel like in general, overall, business, like having knowledge of business is just very practical. And, you know, it's very practical. It's very interesting. And it's very relevant as opposed to doing like some kind of like liberal arts stuff or whatever. Right. So that's what I had suggested to you. And you didn't want to do it. So yeah. instead you went to. Nutrition school. Nutrition school. And I remember thinking that it was a little odd. And I was like, all right, cool, whatever. I, I really didn't care what you did. I remember driving you to the, your nutrition classes in your, in, it, it was like this, in Canada, it was in like the suburbs of Toronto in this strip mall in the dead of winter. And it was on the second floor of the strip mall in, the, yeah. in, your, in your nutrition I was very school. dedicated. So yeah, nutrition came to me actually when I was, I was pregnant with Jake. And I remember how you used to come home and I would be like, we're vegan now. Are we doing this now? Are we eating only this now? You drove me crazy with your nonsense. <laughs> but it was before I went to nutrition school. But I just got so immersed and I was so interested in that. And so after I had Jake, um, after a little while, I was like, why am I not pursuing this? Like, this is obviously still interesting to me and I would love to learn the tools. So I went and decided to start my program at for holistic nutrition. Right. But neither neither you or I took into consideration any kind of like feasibility in terms of what they like, have. Be, yeah, I just I just followed my interests. And obviously I had the privilege to do so because you were like you were working and you were maintaining us financially. And I was just like, I. I didn't really have a direction. I definitely didn't want to do modeling anymore. I couldn't, you know, because we were, I already had to be home and we had a family and all that stuff. So it's like, I don't really had, have a clear... We had both boys already. We had Jake and Ben. Yeah. I okay. was pregnant with Ben when I was finishing my school. Yeah. And... Um, and yeah, so I decided to just follow an interest. So I followed an interest. I did my nutrition program. I remember I then started towards the end of it. I was like, okay, maybe I'll start seeing clients like one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe I'll open like an office. How was seeing clients when you first started? Freaking hated it. Why? Because first of all, we lived in Canada back then and it was like this free healthcare nonsense. And remember like holistic nutrition was not... That's quite a strong not... political statement for somebody who doesn't talk about politics, but please continue. What, because I think that people have a very romantic idea about on it on this thing whatever on this social isn't... on social health care yes okay uh it's very romanticized I, I, you're saying that the people didn't want to pay the rates for a nutritionist because they people in canada are used to not having to pay for anything to do with their health because correct. of social health care correct okay so then you know then what people would come and want to pay i had clients they would kind of expect miracles they were just like well it's been a week and nothing happened yet 
I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I decided that I don't want to do that anymore. And I then decided to be, to have, um, I think I had Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Why are you laughing? I'm laughing because I'm remembering this one story. And I think it was, I don't know if it, if it was something that gave you confidence, but I remember this one story where you came to me and you said, there's some woman. No, I'll get to it. That's something else. Wait. Right. So then we had Benjamin and I decided then, okay, what am I doing with this like diploma? I have all this information. I have all this knowledge. I don't want to see people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I remember I used to go to all these different clinics to be like, hey, can I open maybe an office inside your clinic? And it was just like, it, it wasn't moving anywhere. So then I... Were you, um, were you proud of yourself when you got that first check for $200 for your first... Nutrition. I was, yeah, I was. And I remember I made my own business cards and all that stuff. I was very passionate about it. Um, and with, I really, the, with the $200 from that first client. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I reinvested in my business. You did, you did, you did. <laughs> but I, I think I still have it. I ordered like 3,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, Those are worth a lot now. We should make them into NFTs. Right. And, um, and that's it. And I think that that's when I started looking around and learning about social media and you know being like a, a, a stay-at-home mom and having two kids um, and I wanted to see if I can do something without it compromising like me being at home so I started doing uh, YouTube right but I didn't really know what you were doing I thought you were just kind of messing around yeah Which, I mean you were essentially I so. kind of was messing around yeah so tell me tell me okay so why did you start because that's really the turning point. I think I think in your story and kind of, you know, what led up to your current situation and your current success and this like stardom that you have right now is those initial days. And this was back in 2017, I want to say. This was six years ago. Yeah, around there. So in 2017, Benjamin would have been, our youngest son was two. Benny was two years old. Yeah. Jake was... Three I started old. very slow. So I actually didn't start on YouTube. I started with a blog. Remember modernfox.com? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you started with a blog. I started with a blog and that's when I started like posting recipes and doing all these things. And I was doing the blog about for like maybe six months or so. And then I kind of felt like I wasn't challenged enough because, you know, with a blog, it's the written word and you can just go and edit it constantly. And you know how I am. I'm such a perfectionist. So I just used to focus on such small little things and I just couldn't really bring myself. Like I, I, I just didn't feel challenged. So that's when I started looking at other things that were happening. And that's when I discovered YouTube. Benjamin was two years old. He was already started going to daycare. So I started filming videos and it was the scariest thing in the whole white world. So, okay. So how did you overcome that? So when you say it was scary, I mean, it's just you and a camera. What, what part about it was scary? You, just, you didn't have a live audience. So what was scary? Because I knew that it's going to go out on the internet and all these strangers are going to see me and judge me and you know, not even strangers. Cause I was like, no one's going to actually watch it. I was like, even our friends and family going to watch it. And it's going to be so cringy and so ridiculous. And, but it gave me those like nervous butterflies and usually those nervous butterflies is my signal of like go for it um so like i said i've always been a person that trusted their intuition mm -hmm. and i think that whenever i feel those that feeling i follow it so i felt that feeling and i was like i have nothing to lose because this blog is not really doing much so let me try that and I started just learning the ins and outs of it and what YouTube was and how to upload and how to edit and how to write, you know, SEO. And like, I was very immersed in it. So how did you even know how to edit video? So I went on YouTube and I typed how to edit videos. And honestly, so, YouTube so, is an amazing so platform. This is all, so this all started by you getting in front of the camera and like like typing how to edit video. Yeah, I was like, hi guys, this is Valeria Lipovetsky. And today I'm going to show you how to make blueberry muffins w w was it a was it a difficult transition from i mean modeling in terms of like the you know the modeling work that you had done to actually speaking on camera and yeah. how did you feel about the fact that you you english wasn't your first language I, well, I think that was the biggest challenge i had i always felt so scared to sound stupid but um i think that also in modeling something that just i felt like i really over outgrew was the fact that 
I didn't have my own personality and I didn't really represent it anything but like whatever the client or the brand wanted me to be. So I really didn't like that. Like I was already, I didn't want that in my life anymore. I, so I think for me, as much as I was scared, I was like, this is also an opportunity for me to overcome my fear. So I wasn't thinking this is going to be a career. I was just like, what the hell, let's do it. And if anything, it's going to continue building my, me as a person and like build resilience and I'm going to move forward, you know? And well, how long from when you started making these videos and editing them on your own and, and pushing them out to YouTube. I think you were also, this was before I even knew what you were doing, right? So what caught my attention was $10,000 in our personal bank account, which I didn't understand where it came from. So how long, and we'll get to that in a second, but how long from when you started making videos to when that $10,000 showed up in the bank account? I think it was like a solid year. I was, you know, when I first started, I was making a video once every, I don't know, maybe two weeks, three weeks. By the time I learned how to do things, it took me like days to edit one video. So it started very slowly. And then I was doing videos for Facebook. And then I went back to YouTube. Like it was a journey to figure out what it is that I wanted. Then I started doing vlogs because I saw other people were doing vlogs. So I did like modeling vlog and then I did a mix of recipes and things like that. Anyways, I would say I had like a, the first client that I had was maybe like five or six months in and it was like a probiotic so you, you brand. Just said a, no, it was a different one. It was like a small little that deal. That 10,000 was the first, that was the first money I saw. There yeah, were, but I had other, that? yeah, I but had, had like other, maybe 5,000 people on Instagram. Yeah, but I had like $200 like probiotic brand for YouTube. I didn't even know, this is the first time hearing about it. Yeah, I didn't know about that. I had a couple before the 10,000, but when that, that 10,000 deal came in, I was just like, oh. No, you weren't, oh, because I didn't understand where the money, how did you even get our wire information? You didn't even know what bank we were at. How, was that, how did that even happen? You just, I knew everything. It's just easier to pretend you don't know because then you don't have to do anything about it. <laughs> okay, so okay so from my side of this the ten thousand dollars shows up in the bank account i had no clue i called the bankers i'm like what is this nobody knows and you were the last person i asked because uh, like i said i didn't even know that you knew where we banked and i said to you do you know anything about this and you said yeah this company gave me ten thousand dollars you were very nonchalant about it like it was nothing like you know people sent because sent i was so dollars. immersed first of all because i <clears throat> i mean I was so immersed in what I was doing and I was so excited about what I was doing. It's not the money that was like, wow. It was the fact that this, I was already thinking, I'm like, okay, this brand wants this and this and this, and I have to think about the creatives and I have to, like I was already there, you know? So when you came and asked me about this $10,000, I was like, that's the, you know, the kind of benefit of it, but there's all these other things that I'm so excited about because that's why I feel like it, I, got successful in this industry because it really is my passion. I love creating content. I love telling stories. So, you know, the money is great and it justifies the amount of hard work you do. But I was just excited just for, you know, being alive okay. and like okay, I got brands it. coming to me. Okay, I got it. So are you checking your phone? You okay? Yeah, I just want to make sure it's not. Uh... You have the rest of your day booked off for me. No, I'm just checking if Max is fine. He's living his best of life. Of course okay. he's fine. What do you mean? Why wouldn't he be fine? Anyways, okay. So, okay. So at the point where I saw that 10,000, mm -hmm. I said to you, I started asking you questions about this. You started showing me your YouTube. I really didn't know what the hell you were doing. I know you were kind of messing around. I probably hadn't seen any of your videos at that point. And this was already like a year into it. Yeah. <clears throat> I was doing my own thing. I was busy trying, you know, getting my, trying to get my stuff off the ground and whatever mm -hmm. projects I was working on at the time. Um, and then I saw that and I asked you if I could get involved. Your response to me was that this is not a business. And I said, somebody just sent you $10,000. This is a business. This is, this is something that could be scaled. So what happened after that? Um, Why did you say yes to me? Why did you say yes to when I came to you? Because I, I have a background in, in online uh, media and e-commerce. And you know I've been doing this since 1999. Not in the influencer space, but some form of marketing or media or e-commerce online in general. Um, you know, when I said to you, hey, like, this is a business, and you said no, like, and I asked you, can I participate in this? Why did you say yes to me and not say to me, hey, look, this is my thing, leave me alone? So, because I felt those nervous butterflies again. Um, I think that, obviously, I respect your expertise and all the knowledge that you bring, and I've always respected you as a business person, and I think that, for me, the fact that you came and, like, you know, you saw something in this, and you're like, hey, I think that this can be something really big, 
my first reaction is no because I didn't believe in myself back then and I just didn't see the vision but I got these nervous butterflies and when I got them I was like who I'm ready to jump on this journey whatever it's going to look like and who's better to you know jump this journey with than my husband my partner who wants the absolute best for me and will take care of my you know needs so that's why I said yes you didn't have any concerns around working with your husband no because ignorance is bliss what would I know I didn't have anything to compare it to I didn't know people that work together um, I also think that we've always had good communication skills with each other so I think in a way I knew that we'll figure it out like it will make it even better if anything but um yeah so how did you go from how did, the thing is i know the answer to this question so i think i, I think it'd be good if i told this part of the story you go for i'm it. just thinking like when i interview other people after this i can't do what i'm doing here but yeah whatever i'll at do least your thing. use my, use it for can now. i order food for us I have my meal plan stuff. Oh, okay, yeah. You, you're right. I have a lot of meal plans. Do you want one of mine? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have a meal plan with me? Yeah. It'll be so much fun. Oh, my God. It needs hot sauce, though. No problem. We have Okay, hot tell sauce. the story. Okay. So I remember asking you the question uh, right after that $10,000 came in. I asked you the question. I said, hey, um, tell me about your day. And I remember you saying to me, well, I spend an hour a day in front of the camera and then nine hours a day editing. And that's when I asked you how you learn how to edit. And you told me why well, I learned how to edit because I went on YouTube and I learned how to edit. And so what I said to you is I said, okay, well, we're going to hire a videographer. And once we hire that videographer, that videographer will work eight hours a day. And you'll work instead of one, instead of one hour a day of being in front of the camera and nine hours a day of editing, you're just going to be eight hours a day in front of the camera. You'll be planning out your content and concentrate on the content. And let's, let's multiply the content output by you know, five to eight times. So you agreed to that. So we hired, uh, we hired a videographer and she started and then we started scaling the volume of content that you started putting out because you and I agreed on the strategy of making more content because more good quality content. And then I believe at that point the audience really started growing as you were putting out more content. And as you're, it wasn't just like the time that you were putting into it, it was your mental bandwidth of not like learning, continuing to learn how to edit video, but rather spending your time kind of optimizing you as a human being so you can deliver more value to your to your audience mm -hmm. so we started doing that and then over the years we kept hiring people like looking at you know your time and really dissecting you know everything else that's going on jumping on opportunities hiring different people and so that's how we continue to scale the business you know there's an interesting story i want to tell and, and, and to your credit and it's not something that i've shared before um, and we'll see if we'll share it even now if we'll put this out. But I remember, as you know, I was in between businesses and I was working with a very large social media platform, which I'm not going to say which one it is, but mm -hmm. people could probably guess. And, you know, we were working kind of in a in partnership with them and then they decided to stop the partnership. Mm -hmm. And we were we were doing well. We were starting to get some scale and I had like a whole team. And uh, I think that there were like 30 people working for me at the time. And this social media platform decided that they wanted to change their policies and not allow kind of the business model that I was doing anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they stopped it. And I remember that they'd done this right after we committed to purchasing a new home. Mm -hmm. So we had purchased a fairly costly home mm -hmm. and we had, uh, we were getting a mortgage on this home. Mm -hmm. And I remember that, you know, in order, well, in general, in order to get a mortgage, you have to show income, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to show that you're making a certain amount of money to qualify to get a mortgage. And so now that business where I was drawing, you know, a, a sizable income from that had stopped. And although, you know, I, I had had an exit right around when you and I met, mm -hmm. I had had an exit. And so we were okay from a net worth perspective, but in order to qualify for a mortgage, you have to show income as well with mm -hmm. the banks. And I was no longer able to show income. And the banker who I had a really good relationship with said, if you don't show income, then you're not gonna qualify for this mortgage. And we had purchased this home pre-construction and so we had already put down a sizable deposit. Mm -hmm. So we were faced with losing mm -hmm. a very large deposit mm -hmm. on this home. And I was saying, oh wow, like we're in this like situation You were now. very stressed. I was stressed because it wouldn't have destroyed us to lose the deposit, but when you're looking at losing a lot of money like that over you know something where you don't have the control where <clears throat> the people who you were partnered with 
um, you know, with this platform in order to have your business decide to change their minds mm -hmm. and just say, hey, look, like it is what it is, no hard yeah. feelings. And then the income that we needed to show the banks in order to get a mortgage was pulled away from us. And now, you know, we're, we now no longer can, can, you know, purchase this home without liquidating all these other investments. And anyways, it, it would have been a mess. It would have been, it would have been bad and we would have potentially lost the house and lose then lost the deposit we would have put on it but the fact that you came along and through your efforts we were able to show the income from your sponsorship deals that were at that point coming in at a regular pace um, it's just incredible that and I don't think you give yourself enough credit with the fact that you saved the day and you know you had married a man who's 18 years older than you who was already financially sound who had had you know an exit who had multiple business interests investments and then you come along and you're this, you know, you were maybe 26 at the time, 27, maybe 27, and you basically saved the day. So it's just funny. And I don't think you've ever contemplated it. Like Maybe you have. Maybe you have contemplated it like that. That little Valeria came in after marrying this, like, you know, established older guy with a couple of bucks to, you know, being this, what a lot of people called you a trophy wife, which was never the case. Um, to basically saving the day and people don't know that so all of these haters on the internet who talk kind of shit about you saying oh you're you're a trophy wife this and that they don't know that story how you basically saved all our collective asses I don't think I really contemplated it or like sat on it too much because I think that we have such a partnership between each other that I mean I just I really love how our journey is kind of you know has been where we got married you were kind of, you know, the main source of income and I was doing my thing. You gave me the space to figure out what I'm passionate about, what I like to do, what I don't like to do. I had a chance to be home with the kids. You know, we had two little boys like you. You created that like safe space for me. And once I figured out what it is I'm passionate about, then I got on my kind of, you know, feet and started doing my own thing. And like it's just always this we always very much moved you know in a very nice way where it's not always just all on you or always everything is all on me like we each have our ups and downs and I think that's the the definition of you know successful marriage to me or successful partnership is like we know when to step in when you know the when it's needed so anyways for me it wasn't something that I was like wow little me came and saved the day it was more like I'm so I feel very grateful that I'm able to do it, but I was also was able to do it because well, you give, initially recognized the, yeah, you to, know, but to give myself credit, I mean, operationally, I was very That's and what I, I try to do. I try to give you credit, but it's OK. Give yourself credit. I'll give myself credit in the sense of like, yeah, operationally, like I'm still obviously very involved. Um, I think one of the uh, just moving on, I mean, one of the pivotal, I think, moments is when we, uh, you know, obviously, like we ramped up this team, as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's 15 people in various roles. And one of the people is is uh, Rachel, and Rachel is the CEO of Valeria Inc., right? And Rachel started with us. I believe we just celebrated her. Was it three years or four years? Three years, I think. Yeah, three years. Her three years, and Rachel came in literally, I think, a month before COVID hit, mm -hmm. and then that was that scrambled the business. So when that happened, like, what were your feelings when COVID hit around like what's going to happen to our business? We were still in Canada at the time. So what were your what were your thoughts at that point? You weren't worried? I wasn't worried. No, you were very you were worried for everybody. Um, well, I wasn't I, worried. I, I wasn't worried. I actually just took a lot of action. Yeah, you took a lot of action. I wasn't too worried, but maybe I wasn't worried because you were taking so much action. I was like, Gary will figure it out. Well, I locked everything down. <laughs> you were. It was uh, truly a zombie apocalypse. But for business wise, I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't worry. I think I also love the industry that we're in because we also, we, we drive it. You know what I mean? Like we're so, we are, we're kind of like responsible for our own destiny in a way. Um, unless all the social networks decide to shut down, then we're fucked. Well, no, I would well, I mean, I don't think they're all shutting down. I mean, TikTok is definitely right now under scrutiny. Um, but I don't think they're going to shut down. I think that's a whole other discussion. Anyway, so I think it'll change. I think that yeah. I think TikTok will have to transform in some way. Yeah, probably. But um, anyways, I wasn't really worried. I knew that it's gonna something is gonna happen, um, and I think that COVID was a very big thing for us, uh, for 
our business and for the way we started working as a company. Uh, Rachel has been very pivotal, obviously, to the well, success of our business. But I've also creatively, during COVID, I just woke up one day. The I whole remember. world was shut down. And I was like, I have, I feel like I have this calling to show up for my community and show up in like the best way possible and it was i can't even explain to you it was the most euphoric experience ever it was like out of body experience and your numbers the audience numbers went through the roof yeah. at the beginning of COVID. so i started showing up i was doing the ig lives i was doing the workouts i was doing like everything everything and um, and it felt like I didn't think about anything else, but just like, how do I make whoever's watching me, they feel better or like more positive or more active, anything like that. So, um, so yes. And then as a result, our numbers just changed dramatically. So I, I, you know, what happened at the beginning of COVID, I think was so pivotal and the way that you had, I was so impressed with the way that you handled it. Now, for me, I went into full lockdown mode, as you, you know, as you said, I, I, I really shut the house down. I, we actually moved some staff into the house for you to be able to continue working. Mm -hmm. And I really want to give Rachel a lot of credit because Rachel, she had just started with us and she took our entire company, which was everybody was in office and she got everyone set up to work remotely. She kept the team together. She kept the company culture. And I mean, and, and it's a credit to the entire team. I mean, I, I don't want to just single out Rachel and I want to make sure that we give really credit where credit is due. The, the entire team really stepped up and you know, we propelled forward. And, and, and now I want you to talk to me about this whole moving to Miami thing. Because I think if you look at a lot of these pivotal moments, I think kind of to backtrack chronologically, the pivotal moment was when you started making videos out of nothing and then that 10,000 came in and then you and I partnered up and we, we and, and this is what I still do full time. I have some other interests, but this is what I, the most of my time is, is working with you. Um, so, you know, then that happened and then we, we got some scale and then COVID hit and we went into this crazy, you know, mode and, 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 and Rachel and the team saved the day. And now, you know, scale is being built up. We have a, I think probably one of the most impressive list of clients, lots of fortune 500s, huge companies in various industries that are clamoring to get into your content in the best way possible. Now we're in Canada. We're still in the middle of COVID. What happened? How the hell did we end up here? So the first lockdown, we did, we did the zombie apocalypse. Second lockdown, we went to Costa Rica. I don't want to talk about Costa Rica, whatever. It was an amazing experience for our family. I'm so happy we did it. The kids still talk about memories. You just don't want to get into the details of... I want, I want to get into yeah, the yeah. details because it was a lot of wasted energy. But um, in terms of like the experience itself, and I'm so happy we did it. I really Me feel too. like it changed the dynamic in our family. Um, we did a lot of really cool things. The boys still talk about Costa Rica. And uh, then we went back to Canada and that was then the third lockdown came. And at that point, you know what? I was already, I was really drained. I was really drained with like, just energetically Toronto felt like people were drained as a whole, as a collective. Um, it was, they went really harsh with all the things. And so with the lockdowns. With the lockdowns. And to me, what really made me upset was seeing our children kind of regress. You know, I started like the way they were socializing. They, they were they were withering. They were. Yeah. Yes. And I was just at that point, I, I was like, I can't do this and I can't continue working and I can't continue operating when I feel like there's a. But that's that wasn't. No, no. I understand the premise as to why. No. So sorry. So then you said you saw that I was like done with it because they announced another like harsh lockdown remember parks are closed oh, everything is closed tennis courts they tennis wanna... courts closed Ugh. anyway so i remember we were in the car and i looked at you and i'm like get me out of here like i'm not doing this again and that's why that's when we booked i think one month we got a house for a month or two months so we got a house for three months oh for three months and in Miami. In Miami. So and we were hope we were thinking that okay, in three months, like things will stabilize. You know, P Canada will figure itself out, and then we can come back and continue as planned. But I just kids were doing uh, distance were doing learning anyways. Distance learning. We yeah. had a, we actually had a teacher. We had a public school teacher who we had hired privately mm -hmm. to come to the house, mm -hmm. who was kind of extended their quarantine bubble with us. Mm -hmm. um, 
and she would come over and supervise their online learning with the school. It was horrible. It was horrible. But hold on a second. I want to I want to paint the picture of what happened like around that time. So you and I were in the car. The premier of Ontario announced there's another lockdown, and it was very like George Orwell, 1984, scary. Literally. Another lockdown, and. You turned to me and you said, I don't care what you got to do. You got to get me out of here. Mm -hmm. And to my own credit, I remember what happened. I got on the phone. I hired a shipping company to grab our two cars to ship them to Miami. I got on another call. I found a three-month rental. And then I got on a third call and I chartered a private plane. Mm -hmm. And you and me, three kids, two nannies, and our driver. We had a driver at the time. We don't anymore. We got on this plane. We were so fancy. I don't think, no, stop. We weren't fancy. That driver, we lived an hour away from our studio because we wanted a suburban life for our kids, but we needed to be in downtown Toronto in order to shoot content and to network with yeah. the creative community. So it's not that we're fancy. It's just that. No, we were. We were. What do you mean we were? No, we weren't fancy. What I'm trying to say is that that yeah, was a yeah, practical it was necessary. decision. It was a practical. That was two hours of time on the road that instead of us driving, we were in the back of the car. We had the driver and we had our laptops and we were doing work and you were shooting content in the back of that car. Yeah. So in any case, so we had this whole entourage get on this plane and we took off with a one way flight to Florida with the intention of staying here for three months and see what happens. And then what happened? How did we end up living here? And then I feel like two weeks in or maybe the first month in, we just kind of looked at each other and we we're like, I mean, I don't know. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I am not going back to Canada. I honestly felt like I love Canada. I love everything that it provided for me and my family. And I'm very thankful that we, our kids were born there. And obviously I met you there. But I did feel like, especially in the profession that I'm in, that we kind of hit a wall. Um, we were, when you say hit a wall, I just, sorry, I apologize for interrupting, but when you say hit a wall, I want you to know that on the financial side, we were continuing to scale. So there was yeah. nothing, there was nothing, uh, there was no business case on the financial side to say we need to move anywhere. Yeah. It, there was no business case you, yet. You hit a wall. Hold on. Hold on. Well, no, I know, but that, that remains to be seen. I'm, I agree with you. We made the right decision to be here, Yeah. but we hit a, it wasn't that the, the business hit a wall because the business was still performing. Yeah. In terms of the revenue continued to climb you hit a wall creatively yes i really couldn't find myself in canada anymore i wasn't inspired um i felt like we were just living until our like next vacation i don't know it just i i felt like i really got everything you know out of it and um there was just nothing else for me there and i was ready to move and uh I thought that maybe like these three months in Miami will fix it and then I'll come back in high spirits and like continue doing the thing. But when I m came here, I just realized that in Canada, I didn't have the culture of living. We didn't have the culture of living. We weren't living. We were like working and that's it. Like looking back and looking at how rich my life is here right now, if it's culturally, if it's socially, all the things, we didn't have anything like that back there. Look, I'm going to make a statement about it, and it's not because I feel like I need to be politically correct. It's simply because I don't think it's necessarily a Canada thing. No, it's not. I think it's a compatibility thing with you. Correct. That's what I'm trying. Yeah, I'm not trying and to so, shit on Canada right. by and any so means. And so a month into it, a month into our vacation, not a vacation, our relocation here to get away from COVID. Yeah. I have to credit myself for suggesting that we move here. Mm -hmm. And I have to credit you for making me think it was my idea. <laughs> 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 that, because that's that's what it was. I, I knew it, it. I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt it's what you wanted. Yeah. And I'm always trying to make you happy. First and foremost, because you're my wife. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because the happier you are, the more the content pops off, the more the content pops off, the more everything grows in our business. It is what it is. It's, 100%. it's a nice, it's a nice alignment. But you made a good me. point. I agree. I think that I don't want it to sound like I'm being ungrateful to Canada as we're, a we're country. We're past that already, babe. Everybody knows you're, you, you're, you're good. Like you, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. It was, I outgrew it. That's basically what I'm trying yeah. to say. And I didn't see future. So I saw future here. Um, and uh, for me, uh, yeah, you did the thing and you, you started doing this whole immigration thing which was insane and obviously we're still i mean in it um so yeah now we're here okay 
So in terms of your accomplishments, can you, you're very modest when it comes to your accomplishments, but can you talk a little bit about kind of the high level, I guess, metrics so people understand kind of really the scale that you're at? You know, when I started this episode, I talked about the six and a half million you already did that though audience members no but i think i think a lot of people kind of assume i think i think it's like a, a bit of a mystery as to what influencers actually do in terms of like what their accomplishments so are. so i think that i think that the numbers like six million i i don't think it's as impressive anymore <clears throat> uh, because i think that to build longevity to build like a real brand there's people today i mean there's people that i was watching a year ago that had 50 million followers that are not around today so i don't think it's about the followers i think it's about truly providing something of value I agree. to the audience and i think that if i could toot my own horn is that how you say it can you please toot your own horn because you never do it's kind, of, it's kind of annoying okay so if i could toot my own horn i would say that what i did that was different that with the, obviously the help of you and rachel and our amazing team managed to build this like brand is that i i created from a place of like wanting to build a community i created from a place that shared my real interest and my real um experiences and I just always knew that I didn't want to do it just to do it I didn't want to be famous I don't care to be famous like this I think you still don't want to be famous I don't want to be famous it actually annoys me you know what's interesting I I had dinner yesterday not yesterday a couple of days ago with Food God Mm -hmm. my buddy Food God Mm -hmm. so we had met in Dubai Mm -hmm. and I sat down with him and one of the things that I really admired and it made me think of you is you know we started talking about his career and he's done really well he was you know he was on the Kardashians for for I think most of it. Yeah. Um, and now he's built this amazing, you know, this amazing personal brand. And he said to me, he said, I love being famous. Like I love fame, but it wasn't from like a place of, it wasn't from a place of vanity and it wasn't from a place of like, just be, trying to be cool. He just like, Food God genuinely enjoys fame and enjoys what he's able to give back through that fame. And he just loves what he does. And I thought of you and I, I kind of thought, you know, it would be great if you also started enjoying your fame a little bit more. So I think that what drives me and what keeps me inspired is, first of all, the fact that I really do love to create content. Like even if I didn't have to, I would. You know what I mean? Um, I love telling a story and I truly feel like I'm learning and I'm kind of going through life and its experiences and my lesson. And I love sharing that. Um, I think that, you know, even the, the podcast, the not alone is such a great, like concept of like what my content is about, you know, it's always about that sharing my journey, um, as I progress and evolve in life as a woman. So to me, it's kind of like my personal diary, sharing it with the world. So I don't care for the fame. I enjoy aspects of it. Obviously, I'm not going to lie. I do. But I don't care for it. If I could do this anonymously, I would. You know, I'm very proud of you because you've, you've come a really long way. And I have to credit myself because I don't feel like... I don't <laughs> Yet feel, again. No, I have, to credit, I have to credit myself for the coaching I've given you since the beginning. And I continue to give you because you still require it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't mean... We're good. I don't... And I, when I say, I, you know, I still do it, I don't see it. I don't mean it from a point like from a negative perspective i think it's uh it's a consist it's a constant collaboration and now we really collaborate with rachel as well and i feel the three of us have a really good dynamic so before i get into kind of the last question i, I just i do want to kind of quantify your success a little and i know you're embarrassed to talk about it and so Not i'm embarrassed. just well i'm just going to talk about it i just just for context so people understand that you actually generate millions of dollars per year in sponsorship revenue so we want to get into the specifics but I just, I want you to like, cause you ignore it. Like you, you rarely look at the financials. Like you don't even care. When I start talking to you about it, you're just like, yeah, whatever. You're just, you know, you're, you're in the content, you're providing value to your audience, which is wonderful. But as modest as you are, I think it's important for the audience to understand that an influencer at, at your caliber, at your level with the audience engagement and size and personal brand, you are generating millions of dollars per year in sponsorship. So I just wanted to put it out there just to kind of quantify for the audience what what it is you know and, mm-hmm. and it's that sponsorship revenue that that 
that is propelling our business forward and allows us to invest into other aspects of this business like the podcast. Um, one last thing actually I want to talk about, and you just made a post yesterday about this, is talk to me about the product line. Yeah, so we started the product line um, based on kind of, again, my own interest that I had with uh, jewelry and accessories. We started it, I think, a year before COVID or even less than a yeah, year so before Yeah, so we've been COVID. at it for like four years. Yeah, Yeah. so we started with that, with the jewelry. I absolutely loved it. We managed to really build like a nice little brand. It was Leia back then. And we were able to find a niche in the market where it was um, high quality, but like affordable jewelry. And then we started doing also accessories, sunglasses. It did amazing. COVID hit. We started having issues with supply chain. We started having mainly issues with inflation because we just couldn't far we couldn't offer these products anymore for the prices that I wanted them to be. So we decided to change course and we then we branded to Vary and we did activewear, loungewear, um, and we started with that. Um, also did really well. We then did some pajamas and things like that. Again, really followed what I liked um, and what my audience responded to. Uh, and then we decided to change course again to rebrand and uh, do Valeria the brand. Started to dab into ready to wear, and just had a lot of a lot of learnings throughout. I think a lot of challenges. We also said to do this on our own. We didn't take any you know investments. We didn't bring anybody as partners that were doing it. We really decided, okay, we're going to figure it the out. Brand, we're going to learn it. The brand revenue, the brand sponsorship revenue has been funding this for the last four years. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were, we were doing it. And then I think that at some point we kind of just hit a wall. I personally hit a wall creatively. Uh, just started being really honest with myself and trying to justify, not even justify, but understand why am I doing this? And I think that I've realized that me continuing with this brand was from a place of sheer ego of just like to have a brand be like, hey, I'm a founder of Valeria, the yeah. brand of or whatever, but it didn't actually provide any value. I didn't really solve any issues. And to be honest with you, I just, I just took space that I felt like other people that it's their passion should have this space. So I think that obviously business-wise, it didn't make sense for our long-term strategy, didn't make sense. Um, and I think that as a team, we decided that it's time to, you know, it's, th it's time to wind it down. Speaking of long-term strategy, so I, I understand on the, on, the, on the brand. Yeah. Um, what is the long-term strategy? Wh where, do you, where do you see this going? So I think that um, the podcast is definitely is the first step of where I want to go. Uh, the Not Alone podca podcast is still not where I want it to be. I think I it's really good. I'm, I, I'm, it's probably out of all of the content that, because I've been I've been here for all of the content, and yeah. out of all of the content that we've ever produced, yeah. I feel it's probably of the high, probably one of the highest quality. I agree, and I think it's, again, those nervous butterflies, that feeling of like completely out of my comfort zone, like I see so much room for growth for myself, which excites me very much. That's the projects that I want to take on where I see like, wow, there's so much room to grow, and the podcast is something that I feel it in. Um, I want that podcast to start translating into a book. I want it to translate into um, a conference like around the world. I want like a not alone world tour. You know, I love just it. like, yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. You know, I, one of the things that you and I talked about, and again, this was kind of me pushing on the strategy and obviously like us coming, like I, I initiated the conversation, but one of the things that I had mentioned in the beginning was that, or, or along the way was that this can't just be you doing fashion. And although, yes, you have the aesthetic, you have the experience, uh, in, you know, from modeling, it can't just be fashion and it can't just be your aesthetic. You have to create cerebral content. You have to create value, valuable content for women. You have to take that big sister Definitely. Role. And I think that I, it's not that I have to. It's not that I have to. It's It comes naturally to me. It, it comes naturally to you. And when I say you, you have to, yeah. sorry, I mean, I don't believe that any influencer can have a career long term well into their 40s, 50s, and 60s, like to get to Oprah and Ellen territory, yeah. unless you're creating valuable content that's beyond aesthetic. So 100%. But I think that even if you look back into my, the first pieces of content that I created, there was always, there was always this aspect in it because I get bored really easily. I, like, especially today, I, 
information comes in and out and I forget about people, the stories, the things that I see because they don't capture me. And even for myself, like as a creative, I have to feel like I really left something on the table. When I put something out there, I'm like a piece of me is in it, you know? So as I get older and I understand more clearly, like the message that I have to bring to the world, you know, how I want to share it, like all of that is becoming so much clearer to me. It's becoming even more important to make sure that everything that I put out there means something. And, uh, and yeah, and that's the future. And I am very excited for it. And I'm talking about a lot, of, a lot about it today because I'm really putting it out there. Like, if you remember me a couple of years ago, I would have never felt confident to talk like that and to like share this like big vision that I have, you know? Good. I, look, I'm, I'm really happy about this. I'm really happy because my vision for you from when you started this, remember that first meeting that we had with, <laughs> with there was a, this small kind of uh, agency in, in Toronto when you were only at about maybe 40 or 50,000 followers collectively mm -hmm. and they had invited you in and I came in with you and I already knew at that point that you wouldn't work with them I just wanted to take the interview mm -hmm. and the head of the agency again this is like a five person agency and it was a satellite office from a, a California based company mm -hmm. that was in Toronto and he sat down with the two of us and at the end of the meeting he said what's your vision for this like where do you want this to go mm -hmm. and I tell this story often and I, I looked them square in the eye and I said my wife is the Oprah Winfrey of her generation <laughs> You were so devastated. You were so, you just wanted to hide under a rock and never come out when I said that. And I really embarrassed you, but I really wanted, I was saying it less for his benefit because I didn't really care what he thought. Yeah. And I was saying it for your benefit so you understand what you are and the talent that you have. And I still believe in it to this day. I have to ask you one last question. Yes. Um, no, I have to, no, it's not the last one. It's almost the last one. Um, do you have any how do you feel about the fact that you still work with me? Well, I feel great because I feel like we found a rhythm to the way we work together. Sometimes it can feel like a lot because our life is our work and our work is our life. Um, and that has amazing benefits, but also obviously negative sometimes. But again, I think that it only makes us communicate better. Um, but yeah, I think that right now the way it works, I mean, me on the creative side and and working with our creative kind of team in the business and then just really coming in for high level decisions and you and I don't communicate that much we don't communicate that much at all I feel like you now work closer with Rachel than with me so that has been a really big game changer so I think that it's uh, it's all wonderful I really appreciate and value your you know visionary approach to everything I think you see things way ahead than all of us do um and that's it and i think we're a great team i still believe you're going to be the oprah winfrey of your generation you're I, only you're only 32 i know i think me too yeah um so there are a lot of young women who look up to you mm -hmm. um people in general really look up to you for for not only for what you've accomplished on the business side but they look up to you for the advice that you're able to give them um in terms of how they just everything like you 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 approach subject matter that i feel like is so relevant to so many women and i remember the meetup that you did right before covid hit in london where there were hundreds of people who came and the questions that they asked you in person and back then you were making more fashion content um, but they were still asking you questions about career and relationship and things that really really mattered and i was so proud of you when you were up on that stage so the final you know question that i have for you when it come, when it comes to you know the women who follow you what would be your singular advice to someone who is trying to overcome hardship whether it's professionally personally socially relationship wise when they're going through something difficult what is the piece of advice that you want to give them to help them get through it I mean I think that I truly believe that all these challenges builds our character and resilience and helps you to kind of level up to the next, you know, part of your life. Um, I don't really look, I don't really look at them negatively anymore. I just feel like, okay, this is preparing me for like something really big, 
you know, and this is giving me the tools for the next big thing. And the going through it will bring me to that point. So I stopped looking at these things that like setbacks and started looking at them as like, I'm doing my schooling right now. Like I'm getting the tools, I'm getting the knowledge so I can keep moving, you know, and climbing that whatever mountain I'm on. So I think maybe just reframing it and just looking at it from that perspective gives you a bit more stamina and more motivation to keep kind of walking through these dark corners of life. <laughs> okay, Valeria. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are you going to feed me now? Because I'm starving. I have the meal plan stuff and I have the hot sauce. Amazing. I Thank you, you so much for having me. I love you. Thank you. I, I love, love you. you. Too. You're doing great, sweetie. With what? With everything. Okay. So are you. Thanks.